So we're going to talk about significance tests for beta, which is the slope of the population regression line. The first part here says, what is the standardized test statistic for a significance test for the slope? Uh, it's not a z-score. It's actually a t-score. Uh, we're going to take the sample slope minus 0, or in this case, we can call it beta sub 0, the beta from the null hypothesis, divided by the standard error of the slope. So you should recognize that from t-scores or z-scores that we've done previously. Take some sample data, subtract the null hypothesis value, and divide by some sort of standard deviation. Uh, and again, beta sub zero from the null hypothesis, that's going to be zero for us. Uh, is this on the formula sheet? No, not the way it's written. And then what degrees of freedom should we use? So for scatter plots, we're going to use n minus 2, just like there's two variables, x and y. It's like they get an extra degree of freedom because there's two variables. So the degrees of freedom will be n minus 2. So the next part here, what are the two explanations for the, and that should say negative, why, why is there a negative association in the row number versus test scores example? And we did that example at the beginning of the notes. Um, well, for starters, there really could be an association between where you sit in the classroom, like in the front or the back, and the test scores. So there really might be an association, or what we looked at in the example might have just been due to random chance. So the other explanation is there's actually no association between those two things, and the association we saw in the sample data was just due to a random chance occurrence which would have been due to the random assignment, right? The students were randomly assigned to treatments, which were the rows. So the first example here says, do customers who stay longer at buffets give larger tips? Charlotte, an AP statistics student who worked at an Asian buffet, decided to investigate this question for her second semester project. While she was doing her job as a hostess, she obtained a random sample of receipts, which included the length of time and minutes the party was in the restaurant and the amount of the tip, which is in dollars. Do these data provide convincing evidence that customers who stay longer give larger tips? So part A says, here is a scatter plot of the data with the least squares regression line added. Describe what this graph tells you about the relationship between the two variables. And we've also got the actual data over here as well. Uh, so each one of these represents a dot on the scatter plot. So just as a reminder, we have to describe uh, a scatter plot. The best way to go about that to get full credit is to use the DOFS acronym, Direction, Outliers, Form, and Strength. And we can do that in one sentence. So we can say there appears to be a weak comma, right? That scatter is actually pretty weak. It's not overly linear. Uh, the direction is positive. And the form we're suggesting would be a linear association. So strength, direction, and form. And then to add context, we'd say between the time a party was at the restaurant and the amount of tip. And then we might want to point out a couple possible outliers here. Uh, for example, this party was there for 39 minutes and only tipped 275. And then we might want to mention these two dots up here. So that would be the parties that tipped or stayed for 65 minutes and 67 minutes. So it looks like those three groups might represent some outliers. In fact, if we delete those, that definitely improves our correlation. The next part uses the same data, except it says more mini-tab output from a linear regression analysis on these data is shown below. So there's the computer output. Uh, so the linear regression is there. And we've also got a residual plot and then a normal probability plot of the residuals. So part B says, what is the equation of the least squares regression line for predicting the amount of the tip from the length of the stay? 
and define any variables you use. So when it says define any variables you use, we're definitely going to use the fat hat method here. So this problem has given us the scatter plot, it's given us the residual plot, and it's given us a normal probability plot of the residuals. They've even done the regression for us. So to get our line, let's start with the slope. So the x variable is time, and the coefficient on the x variable, there's our slope. And then our y-intercept is the constant. So we can use the fat hat, in this case, the predicted tip amount is equal to 4.535, the y-intercept, plus 0 0.0313 times the time. So the question that we're really after is, does this slope that we got from the sample data convince us that there's a positive association between the amount of time a party stays at the restaurant and how much they tip. So part C says go ahead and interpret the slope and the y-intercept in context. So we'll start with the slope, which was 0 0.0313. So we can put that over 1 if we want. Uh, in this case, that means for each 1 unit increase in the x, so we could say for each additional minute that a party stays at the restaurant, the predicted tip amount actually increases by this much. So we could say about three cents. And then for the y-intercept, which is 4.353, uh, not really as realistic. I guess that's maybe some of the orders carry out, right? So for a party that stays zero minutes at the buffet, we'd predict them to tip $4.53 approximately. Okay, so that's a skill that we should have down by now, interpreting the slope and the y-intercept. Part D says carry out an appropriate test to answer Charlotte's question. So let's reiterate what her question was. Her question was, do these data provide convincing evidence that customers who stay longer give larger tips? In other words, do, does this prove that there's a positive association? And we're going to measure that with the slope of an LSRL. So it's time to bust out a hypothesis test, a.k.a. state, plan, do, conclude. So let's start with the state step. We want to test, and let's get our alpha level out there. We're going to use alpha equal to 0.05. Our null hypothesis, and we're going to refer to beta here, the slope of the true regression line. Right? If there was a true population regression line that we could refer to, the null would say there is no association, so it would be beta equals zero, the slope equals zero. There's no positive association, there's no negative association, in fact, there's no association at all. And then what Charlotte's data suggests is that there's actually a positive association, so the true slope would be greater than zero. So when we, we run a test, we're going to get a p-value that tells us how rare it would be for Charlotte to get a sample slope like this, 0 0.0313. So we can't forget to define the parameters here in the state step. So we can say where beta is the slope of the true population regression line relating length of stay, which is the x variable, to the tip amount, which is the y variable. Okay, so that should get us full credit for the state step. In the plan step, we want to start out by naming the test that we're going to run. So we've actually run quite a few different tests this semester. Um, the name of this test is a t-test for the slope. So we can say if the conditions are actually met, we'll do a t-test for the slope beta. And hopefully you remember the acronym for the conditions when it comes to linear regression. That acronym is LINER. So this helps us meet our conditions. L stands for linear. Is the trend actually linear? So if we look at the scatter plot, the scatter plot shows a linear trend. I mean, it's kind of weak, but you know, it's linear. So the trend is there. 
And even further, the residual plot doesn't show any leftover patterns, right? There's no curves. Uh, it looks just like a random scatter of points, which is a good thing in this case. So for the L, the linear part, uh, we can say the scatter plot shows a linear trend, although it's weak, but it's still showing a linear trend. And there's no leftover pattern in the residual plot. So that gets a check mark. Linear is good. So the I in liner stands for independence. Uh, and we can say that in two different ways here. We can say, well, knowing the tip amount from one group shouldn't provide any additional info about the other groups, right? They're independent of each other. And further, if we think about all the different groups that would eat at this restaurant, you'd have to assume there's at least 10 times the sample size, 120 tips in this case, for this restaurant. So we should be good with the 10% condition as far as the tips are concerned. Not to mention, the tips themselves should be independent of each other. Okay, and then the N in liner, that does actually stand for normality, but normality of what? So we want to actually look at the residuals and say that they're roughly normally distributed. So the residual plot actually doesn't help us do that. But if we have a histogram of the residuals, or in this case, my personal favorite, a normal probability plot of the residuals, this can help us make the argument that there's no outliers and there's really no strong skew. So if the normal probability plot is roughly linear across the diagonal, that means that the residuals, you could consider them to be approximately normally distributed. So this is called a normal probability plot. And if you look in the middle, there's zero for z-scores. And it takes each residual and plots it against its own z-score. So as long as this is roughly linear, we can say that the residuals are approximately normally distributed. So that's how we prove the n, the normality condition. We could say the NPP, the normal probability plot of the residuals, looks roughly linear. And that's good enough for us. If they'd given us a histogram of the residuals instead, we could have just said the histogram of the residuals doesn't show any strong skew or strong outliers, so uh, we'll assume the normality condition is good. Okay, let's get to the E condition. The E stands for equal variance, which basically just means the spread in the residuals is the same above and below that zero line. And if we look at our residual plot here, uh, we already said previously that there's a random scatter, but yeah, it does look like there's a fair amount of spread, right? A fair balance of scatter of points on each side. It's not like there's a pattern that we can see uh, or one side's overly dominant. So to check that equal variance condition, that's the E from liner, we could just say the residual plot shows approximately the same amount of scatter above or below the residual equals zero line. So that gets a check mark. We're good on that condition. Last but not least, uh, the receipts were selected at random. So the R in liner for randomness, that condition's good. The problem already said it was random. All right, on to the do step. Uh, and I actually want to look at the computer output for some of these values. For example, and this didn't work for confidence intervals, but now that we're doing a hypothesis test, I want to look for the test statistic here in the computer output. So remember, in this section, we're doing inference about the slope. So that would be this row. So the standard error of the coefficient right there, that actually is our value for the standard error of the slope. The way to read this computer output if we're making inferences about the slope, and that's our x variable, then other than the y-intercept up here, we really don't need anything else in this top row. So that's the standard error of the slope right there. And next to that would actually be our t-score, or our test statistic, t. But I want you to keep in mind, this would be the t-score for a two-sided test statistic.
And all that means is our null hypothesis would be the not equal to case. So if we could illustrate it on a curve, it'd be like marking off t at 1.23 and then t at negative 1.23 and shading both of those tails. So again, uh, the computer output is kind of set to a default to give you a two-sided test statistic and therefore a p-value. But that only corresponds to the not equal to case. Like if our alternative hypothesis says beta is not equal to zero. So the p there then is the p-value, but it's really twice as big as the one we want. We don't actually want both tails. We're not interested in a two-sided test at the moment. So for our p-value, we're actually going to have to divide this by two. We only want one of these tails. So we can get our test statistic from the computer output. That's 1.23 for our t-score. Um, but our p-value in the computer output, remember the computer has a default of being a two-sided test for that not equal to case. And that's not actually what we want here. So we're going to take the p-value they gave us in the computer output uh, and we want the one for a one-sided test, right? We just want the one tail. For example, just the tail that was bigger than 1.23. So easy enough, if we just want the, the upper half tail there, we'll just take the p-value that we're given and divide it by two. So 0.1235 is our p-value. And we do uh, since this is a t-distribution, have to mention the degrees of freedom. Easy enough, right? There's 12 receipts, so n minus 2 in this case would be 10. It is important to mention degrees of freedom uh, as far as getting credit on the AP exam is concerned. So for the do step, as long as you can come up with these three things, right? Test statistic, your t-score, the p-value, and the degrees of freedom, you're going to be in business. Can you use the calculator to get those? Yeah, of course you can. We'll get to that in just a moment. So lastly, let's conclude. We got this p-value of 0.1235, and that's not low enough, right? So we can say, because our p-value of 0.1235 is larger than alpha equals 0.05, we failed to reject the null hypothesis. So we couldn't find enough convincing evidence of that alternative. So we make our last summary statement. In terms of the alternative hypothesis, do we find evidence to support it or not? And in this case, since we couldn't reject the null, we couldn't find convincing evidence that, in context here, that parties who stay longer at buffets lead larger tips. We could not find convincing evidence of that. In other words, without context, we couldn't find convincing evidence that the true slope or that the true association was positive for the x variable, how long they stayed, and the y variable, how much they tipped. Okay, lastly, can you use your calculator to conduct a test for the slope? Uh, yes, you absolutely can. A couple things to note. S on the calculator is the standard deviation of the residuals. Okay, and also, if you want to find the standard error of the slope, you can always go back to this formula, right? T equals the sample slope minus zero divided by the standard error of beta. Or the standard error of B, rather, the sample slope. Uh, so you get the T-score, you have the sample slope. You can just solve for the standard error of beta. So I think I mentioned this in the last notes, too. But if you run into a problem like this, uh, you can solve for the standard error of the slope that way. All right, so we've got some experience now conducting a test for the slope. Just to remind you, the null hypothesis will always say beta equals zero, which means there's no association for the true population regression line. And then your alternative could be less than, greater than, or just not equal to zero. Okay, so that's all for now. And that is actually all for Chapter 12. I'll see you in class.